Uh, it's started recording now. So um, I'm going to talk to you a little about, about what we've done in SYO. Um, and I hope you find it useful. Okay. So um, why develop your club? It's important uh, to evolve, I think. Okay. But you need to make your club a club, not an organization that puts on events. All right. What's the reasons for developing? Um, everyone will have different reasons, but some of them attract new members, make members more active, improve the skills of volunteers, maybe provide better quality events, perhaps include your club performances. Okay, lots of reasons to develop. Okay, so um, most clubs would agree with the need to develop, but where do you make a start? And I think the important thing is to work out what you currently do. Okay, what are you actually doing as a club? And then think about what you want to achieve. What are your aims and objectives? How often as clubs do we talk about to our members um, and find out how we can improve their experience? And what might they want? May it be training sessions, coaching, club nights, socials, leagues, new kits? new website, maybe it's a way we, a change in the way events are run, okay? And also you need to perhaps understand the challenges your club's facing. Um, is it an aging volunteer force? Is it a lack of juniors? Um, perhaps you've got a really large rural geographical area that you've got to cover, cover. Maybe you've got quite a lot of members, but they're not very active. Maybe the committee is not interested in developing, or maybe you're actually losing members. I think mean, all orienteering clubs face challenges of some sort. Right. And, and I think the most important thing is that you can't be sole person developing a club. You need to get together a group of like-minded people to drive the changes. Okay, you can't do it on your own. Okay, and the best way to develop I think is to learn from others um, we can all learn from other clubs successes and mistakes um, I'm always looking for ideas from other clubs like reading articles in Compass Sport following other clubs social media looking at the website talking to people um, it's you know there's fantastic development work going on all over the place and it's a real inspiration for new ideas um, so I'm going to run through our development journey um, and obviously you know I know not everybody would be able to do what we do as a club um, because we all have different challenges but hopefully there'll be some ideas um, please ask questions um, and hopefully we'll get some opportunity for discussion at the end okay so for a long while SYO was an elite club Okay, members came from Shuok, elites joined the club to run a good relay teams, but often didn't live in South Yorkshire and we weren't a large club particularly. And all the existing 21s got older and ex Shuok people weren't staying in Sheffield after graduating. And we had a few good juniors, but they were all about to go to uni. And we had some newcomers that came along to the event, but they never joined the club. Okay, or very few of them, because there was no reason to join. So we needed to become more of a club, but we needed to get people orienteering first of all. And a key thing to be really aware of is developing your club is a long process. So our position in 2011, okay, the club had 180 members. We ran quite a few events. We had some evening events, some, some coaching sessions, some socials. We tried a club night, but we hadn't had many people and it wasn't sustainable. Okay, so we were a club that put on events and ran in relays. Why would you be a member? Um, and we tried to come up with some reasons why people should join. And all we sort of seemed to come up with was, well, you have to join after three events to be insured, which is not a great selling point. Okay, so like many clubs, we decided to put on a series of come and try it. We had some success, but it was nothing groundbreaking. We did um, some local events on Saturday morning and a few people turned up. Um, 
Why didn't it work? Uh, well, one of these events was in a local park near our house and I did two laps of the park before I even managed to find the registration and start that had been hidden on a residential road behind the park. And I went on my own, not with my family, because it clashed with my kids' tennis and dancing lessons. So people didn't know about it. It wasn't very visible and the timing wasn't right. Okay, so we reevaluated this and come 2012, 2013, we um, put together a new series of come and try it. And this was a very consistent format and people knew about these dates and it was always on a Saturday afternoon and we ran a white, a yellow and orange, very short, easy courses, and then just something else for experienced orienteers. And we based ourselves outside cafes and in places with high visibility that newcomers were comfortable to get to and knew where they were. And they were all really close to each other with a very small area. And we had familiar smiley people to greet them at every event and proper results, okay? And we did a lot of marketing and communication. Um, ways of marketing and communicating constantly evolving. So at the beginning, we didn't use social media, but now I can't imagine doing it without that. Um, but I think the key point is that you've got to use lots of different methods and those methods keep changing. Okay, so we had a banner outside the events to begin with, and we printed a simple flyer. And at the end of the series, we asked people to fill in a questionnaire to try and get some feedback on it. And we had some successes. Our first event had 90 people with 40 on white, and lots of people came to all the events. And in fact, some of the juniors that came to those very first events are now members of the GB Talent Squad. Okay, so it had gone well, um, but very few had joined the club. And if we went, had an event slightly further away, not many people went to it. And actually as a club, we weren't really doing any coaching or social event. And we put on some schools lead pilots before and very few children had come along. So it'd been all right, but not great. And now here's the really depressing slide. We'd worked really hard, but actually our membership was lower than when we started. And we still had hardly any juniors. So a lot of work had gone in and we didn't have much to show for it. So we relaunched the Schools League in um, 2013 and we combined it with our newcomer events. And we worked really hard with the school sports partnerships to advertise the key teachers and schools. And we used existing relationship in schools. We focused on schools where we had club juniors and we encouraged those juniors to bring their friends. And we got club members to promote to people we knew. And we had a big glossy flyer that we gave out to explain what orienteering was and what all the events involved. Uh, and we had a big prize giving at the end um, and we tried to advertise coaching at the event and we also had a registration system so we recorded people's details once um, and then we had their email addresses and it was a whole series of nine events through the year which were laid out at the start okay and I can't um uh, emphasize enough the importance of the marketing and communication um, because you just need to get people to come along. So we uh, printed 5,000 flyers and we went along to schools cross country races and gave them out to every finisher there um, because we felt that they might be the sort of people that would be interested in orienteering. And we put banners at the venues and we advertised in local newspapers and magazines and got teachers and parents to promote, used Facebook. We uh, put on mazes at outdoors events and gave out flyers there. Um, and I think we, uh, word of mouth was really important as well. People came along and enjoyed it and told their friends about it. And this had a big impact on the numbers coming along. 
Okay, I haven't, we haven't really talked about funding on money. Um, so the SFSS, which is the Schools Federation of School Sports, actually um, gave us money uh, to pay map, map costs and levy and the, on the condition that Sheffield Kids Run was for free. Um, but I'm not sure whether how much of a difference being free made, whether a low cost would have put people off, probably not. Um, I think the benefit of it was that schools were really happy to promote it because it wasn't like they were funding a private company. Um, so I think that was a benefit of it. Um, but there is always opportunities for funding and I'll talk to you in a bit about how we received a grant from Sport England to fund a specific new project. Okay, so uh, we were getting 100 plus runs at most events, uh, but the coaching that we tried to do at the event didn't really work. People were interested in that and only a small proportion were joining the club. Um, we, we wanted to try and get these Saturday afternoon orienteers to be Sunday orienteers, and we wanted them to be club members that would run for us, join squad, junior squads, help at events. Um, we had an audience, we had participation, but we hadn't really changed the club offering. So it's not surprising they weren't joining the club. So we looked at why people might want to join a club, and thought about why they might not be joining SYO. And we embarked on a number of different initiatives to develop the club. Okay, so why, why do people join the club? Um, Socialising, meet with others that have shared interest, to learn new things and improve and to be part of a team. So we were just a club that put on events. It's pretty obvious why we're not getting new members. Okay, so the first thing that we did that we thought was really important was we developed a coaching programme, um, helping people develop technical expertise so they enjoy the orienteering and improve is really key to attracting and retaining members. Um, people are used to training and having coaching when they start a new sport and orienteering is a bit unusual in that we just send people off to compete. And I think that developing a coaching program was really key to the success. And um, we'd run coaching before, but the sessions weren't regular, they weren't communicated, and so no, not many people attended. And the coaching events didn't work, but putting the coaching sessions on at the same time as the events, but on a different Saturday, um, that seemed to be work quite well. Um, uh, we advertised to, uh, at the events and we sent personal invites to people who joined the club or who had come to lots of the newcomers events. Um, and I think a really important thing is that we split the juniors into different ages. Um, someone who's 12 doesn't want to run with someone who's eight, you know, so we split them up into different groups. And we, uh, we put on parents coaching as well because we wanted to get the parents involved. And, a, and the final thing that I think was really quite successful was he made it free to members, but it was a charge for non-members. So it was an encouragement to join. You might as well join um, and you get free coaching. Uh, we established, what else makes a good club? An opportunity to socialize. Uh, so we established a, a regular series of socials after events, once a month, and we sent personal invites to new members to come along. Um, and we did things that um, probably all clubs do, you know, a summer barbecue, a club chance with awards that recognize volunteers and beginners and improvers. Um, I think the key thing was that the social events were now consistent, regular, and they were communicated so people knew what they were getting. Uh, we redeveloped the club identity, revamped the website, um, new club kit, hoodies, new logo. Um, the kids really liked the kit and they wanted to join the club so they could have good kit. Um, 
And we started up a development group to meet and discuss projects and plans for the future and evaluate what we'd done well and what hadn't worked. Um, and again, going back to the communication, um, it's just really, really important. Um, website and social media is important because that's what new people see. Um, lots of information about different events, the different competitions and who they, what they are and who they're suitable for. Um, emails and newsletters to club members about what the club is doing and what's on, personal invites, uh, use of Facebook to promote and celebrate things. <coughs> and uh, the club appointed a club development officer and coach. And this took the pressure off the volunteers so they could get on with planning, controlling, organising and coaching. Basically, the development coach was um, doing all the administration. Um, and it meant we had a coordinated, joined up approach, newcomers knew who to contact or uh, new club members. And all the communication from one source came from one source. And we ensured evening events and socials, and coaching and league events all happened when they were meant to happen. Um, and it had a massive impact. So we had 165 members in 2013, and by 290, uh, by December 2017, we had 290. And you can see big increase in the number of juniors, but also in the 40 to 50 bracket as parents are joining too. And feedback from parents was that they really liked that it was a sport that they could join in to, with rather than just dropping their kids off to, or, and watching a swimming gun on the side of the football pitch, they could have a go to. It's a great family sport. So what next? Okay, we're now in 2017 and we had lots of new members, but a lot of them weren't very active and they still only came to our Saturday events. So our next aim was to make our new members more established in the club. And we wanted those members to compete at bigger events, run for the club and become volunteers. Um, so planning for a re regular club night started and we applied for a small uh, grant from Sport England and was successful with a 9,000 pounds grant. Um, we tried a club night several years earlier but it hadn't been a success because we didn't have new members and new participants to come along but now we did and we had 50 participants per week and we split our group into eight to elevens and then over twelves uh, and the sessions were 45 minutes of physical like intervals or um, run or um, variety of different physical activities, sometimes circuits, and 45 minutes of some sort of technical activity. Um, we were based at school during winter and different locations in the summer. And we charged for this. And after its first year, it was self-funded. Um, and Schools league participation continued to increase. We managed to get over 200 runs on a white course. And we started to branch out a bit and try and encourage um, participants to go slightly further afield. And we renamed it as a Saturday series because whilst we were getting lots of kids running, um, other adults were a bit reluctant. Um, but renaming it a Saturday series and marketing as that was quite successful. And then we put on longer and harder courses for the adults who were progressing, often using the urban areas outside the confines of a park. Um, and also we wanted to offer harder courses for our club members that wanted some local orienteering. And we set up a new adults league based on this Saturday series. Um, we still. Sorry, Colin, I've just got a wee question. Come on here, yeah. for me, Ian. Um, if you don't mind. 
So, so how did you promote the skills league? Okay, so um, like loads and loads of different ways. Um, we worked with the school sports partnerships. Um, we got in touch with schools where we had relationships, where we had club juniors. We used social media. We used banners at events. We advertised in free magazines and newspapers. Uh, gave out, we printed all those glossy flyers and went to schools cross country meets and gave them out there. Gave them out at community clubs and events. Um, guide scouts, that sort of thing. Um, put them in running shops, I mean, libraries. Um, email people that were, um, that had been to previous events whose details we'd had. Do you think of any more? Um, well, what I would say is that we, we weren't, we, we weren't, we, yeah, we weren't reliant on um, this teachers in the schools kind of, kind of bringing the kids to the events and things like that. We tried to make it very clear that that we didn't want to add to their workload and and so you know the, the parents bring the kids along and just um do the events that way so actually th th there's no real effort from the school to actually run these school leagues so um i think they're quite good at they're quite like that um, yeah. and it's, um, it's, it's very much word of mouth as well probably word of mouth is still the biggest but yeah and i think um if you just get teachers bringing the kids along the problem is that then you don't get them to other events. The parents need to come along and we need to get them involved to then get them to be club members and do do other events. Yeah, and uh, Pauline, I just, I'm gonna develop this question actually about yeah. schools league. Um, was, it, was any of the, the events you used, were they in school grounds or were they all outside school grounds? And uh, park, they were, no, they were all just in our local parks. Okay. Um, now, we did have schools that did come, like the teachers would come along um, and be there um, and meet the parents and the kids there in effect. But the parents... But the but the parents had to bring the kids. It wasn't like the kids... The teachers brought the kids in a minibus or anything. So that worked really well for encouraging some kids to come to the first one so a teacher would say oh i'm going to be there on saturday why don't you come and that was really effective i hope that's answered your question ian thank you pauline okay. so um we wanted to uh encourage people to uh join in come to our sunday events um uh so we borrowed the park run concept and uh, gave out T-shirts if people attended 20 events and 50 events. And if you volunteered, you also got a credit towards your T-shirt. Um, and we tried to market. Um, we made sure that our members and people who've been to our Saturday series knew about these other events. Yeah, I mean, the, the T-shirts were free. Um, so and probably cost the club around well just under 10 pounds each but then you're getting people to come along to 20 events so yeah that's you know it pays for itself basically uh, right we also needed to increase our volunteers and lots of the new adults and juniors were keen to help but needed to learn some skills uh, and the i've just shared on like this screen some of the ways we develop volunteers. Um, I'm sure many clubs do very similar things and have um, probably have better ideas that we could use. <laughs> Please feel free to share them. But these are just some of the things that, that we do to try and encourage people to help, try and encourage people to uh, become event officials. Um, a large proportion of our local events now are planned by juniors or parents that started orienteering through our schools league, the original schools leagues. Okay. Um, I think an area that's been really key to our sex, sex as a club has been the development of our juniors. You know, juniors are the future of orienteering and we need to develop or the more our sport will decline. And I think the uh, seeing success of juniors inspires the others coming through. 
and for a lot of juniors being part of a team and a social scene is very important uh, and juniors are keen to go to the major events and encourage parents along um, we you know we try we, we do all of the junior competitions like the Yvette Baker and the Peter Palmers um, and we personally invite juniors to come along to those and it's a really good way of getting them to go to other events um, and encourage them then to perhaps do a British Champs or a Northern Champs that's nearby. Um, we'll send a personal invite and say, oh, why don't you try the Northern Champs is, um, you know, only an hour's drive away. Why don't you enter that and have a go at it? Um, yeah, I mean, what we tend to find is that the, the juniors and parents would take the kids to the other end of the country for like a, a club competition. Um, but wouldn't travel like an hour to go to a, a like a what we would call you know a regional event that kind of thing. So you know these these competitions were really important, um, and and getting the kids together, you know, in, you know they 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 meet the other people, they get to know everybody, and it really it encourages that social scene. That the photo you can see there is from a Peter Palmer's, I think, at um, Sutton Park. Um, so. Uh, Actually, membership stayed fairly static in this period. It was 290 in 2017. And you can see still only a few more members in 2018 and 2019. Um, we were still bringing in a few new members, but there were others that left, moving out of the area and the sport not for them, ill health. Um, but this wasn't a concern for us. We, we now were focusing on developing our club members and getting them running for the club. Um, and the members we had were now definitely loads more active, particularly the new families that we had. Um, and the focus on coaching and developing juniors um, led to loads of team successes in competitions and that created a great club feeling. So, uh, What's happened since 23rd of March 2020, the COVID time? Um, well, we still really focused on trying to be a club. Um, and we did a lot of um, activities to make people feel as though they were a club member. Um, we tried, we did something whenever we could. Whenever restrictions permitted it, whenever there was a little opening up, we made sure that we put something on. Um, and often... You know, sometimes an event would get cancelled. Sometimes we only got permission two days before the event. It was stressful, um, but worth it. And members were really appreciative of what we did in that time. Um, and our membership actually grew. We were at our high, biggest that we've ever been at the end of 2020. Um, I think people joined to do our temporary orienteering courses and they also, um, when events we started, people had to be a member, so people joined off the back of this. Uh, and where are we today? Um, the club's in a good position. Um, we've restructured club night now um, and that's made it more attractive to adults and our older secondary age juniors. And we get 70 plus participants each week and lots of newcomer parents. Um, at the end of 2019, we identified we really wanted to encourage more young adults to the club. And we invited some of our MW21s to the pub and asked them what they want uh, and developed a WhatsApp group for them so that they could plan runs and see who was going to events and share lifts and things. And this group has definitely become more active and got more involved in the club and you know our membership in that area has gone up there's lots of work still to do in it on this but it, we're moving in the right direction um we we've got an event on sunday um which is we've really marketed tried to market to fell runners and the 21s age group and um, we've put on a it's a normal regional event, but we've also put on a 90 minute score using the controls we're already using. Um, and we've had um, 16 independent M and 
W21s enter it, which is fabulous. You know, it, it, that, that seems to have worked. Um, I think it's quite hard sometimes to, even though newcomer events in our parks, our Saturday series is suitable for everybody, it, it's quite hard to market it effectively to everyone. Um, but an event on Blackamoor in the winter is far less suitable for families. So we sort of changed how we promoted it and made it, tried to promote it to fell runners and it seems to have been gone quite well. Um, what else we've got our 50th year. So um, that's creating a bit of a buzz. Um, and um, still having lots of junior successes. Uh, eight of our juniors um, ran at the JHIs this year. And our Wednesday evening events get 100 plus participants even at night. Uh, and this is our club at the end of 2021, uh, 312 members. Um, you can see we've still got the teenage drop off in the older years. But um, I think partly that's just due to the huge numbers of four teams we've got with 35 of them. Um, and we've got high numbers of uh, parents in their 40s and 45s and 50s. Um, can, I, can I just inter yeah. interrupt there? I've got yeah. a few questions coming here. So um, before we go on. I'll go back. Any yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, one of the questions was, um, from Louise, how do you, how do you avoid you losing a lot of juniors to other sports? I think that's a question which a lot of clubs might have, and I'm interested um, to hear from anybody else on, on the call here um, if they've got any school success or youth organise uh, organisation success about so how they sort of retain the juniors. So it's about them having a social life and having friends within the sport. So you know, once you get enough teenagers interested and they 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 can socialize and they have friends then that keeps them interested in the sport um so you know that club nights really help with that because they come along and they they are all in groups for their age group so we've got um those aged 16 to 18 in one group those aged sort of 13 to 15 in another group um, and so on. Um, so they're, they're, they're with their friends um, and, the, and, and then going to the club, you know, the club events, that, that really encourages a good socialising. We took two coaches of kids down to the British Schools Championships. You know, they, they had a good day out with their friends on the coach. Um, it, it's creating those social opportunities so that they've got friends, basically, I think that's the most important. There's not that many other sports where they can go away on weekends away and things like that, where they just they can spend quite a lot of quality time with their peers and, and really get to know people um, and go to different parts of the country and all this kind of stuff. It's yeah, that, that's like one of the major things, I think, to, to keep people in sport. But inevitably, people drop away. You know, they'll start to focus down on one sport or, or they might just stop sports altogether. And that's almost inevitable. It, it's, it's why you want that massive number of you know, people in the 12s and 14s, you need that, you need that peak to be as big as you can so that when there is a drop off, it's, it's, you've still got lots of people coming through. Yeah, so, I mean, you can see from ours that we do get a drop off from 14 to 16 and again to 18, but there's still enough there to keep the ones that are keen and interested involved. It's, it's about having like a critical mass almost, isn't it? It's, it's, it's very hard if you've only got sort of you know, a, a handful of, of, of juniors to over quite a wide range to get that social cohesion going. You, you kind of, which is why we focus on the participation to start with, so that when we started doing these things, we were able to produce, create that social atmosphere. Um, yeah. Brilliant. I've got, I've got a few more. Thanks. Um, yeah. So. There's, I was mentioned you restructured your club night. Um, just there's a question here from from Jan about what what did you do to restructure it? What was it before? Um, yeah, so I mean it was partly COVID related. Um, well, it was mostly COVID related. 
um, because we had to, when, during you know, all the restrictions, we could only have groups of six. So we had to get loads of different adults involved or get people, just put people into little groups of six to, to work in groups. Um, and obviously we couldn't go inside at all. So we had to stay outside throughout the whole winter. But what we actually found was this made the club night much more popular with um, the older teens and more experienced orienteers and adults because they were getting a bit bored of just coming to a school and doing map, like map activities and so on. Um, so even though now we can go back to the school, we only go once a month because once a month you can come up with new ideas of things to do inside. But week after week after week, it just gets a bit boring and, and, and you run out of new ideas. So that that's um, and more of and we've split into smaller groups. So rather than just all over 12s together, we have these different groups with an adults group that's separate and a 12 uh, and a 12 to 14s group and a 14 to 16 group. So that they're um, socializing with the same age. Brilliant. I've got a couple more questions, if you don't mind following on. No, you can't. Might as well get them in now. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. This, this one, to me, I, I, I jotted this one down myself to ask you later anyway. So um, we'll sort of link to this anyway. How, this is from William. How big was your development group um, who got this thing going initially? And my sort of thing was, was, was a development group or development team? I presume it wasn't necessarily committee. Was it a broader demographic than that? So the, the two people that got that really drove the development to begin with were Colin Best and Pete, my husband. Um, Colin Best had been a regional development officer for British Orienteering and he'd given that role up, but and I think he'd not long retired and he had the time to spare. And he had a lot of contacts from being a teacher in Sheffield and from doing his regional development role. So it was him that got the initial schools, um, the you know, idea of the schools league and newcomer events. But Pete, Pete were you acting chair at that time? Were you chair? I can't remember what it was, but uh, Pete, was, Pete was on the committee. So it was part committee led and part a really um, uh, motivated individual. Um, that that yeah. drove so the in, development. So in that first year, Colin planned all the all the events and I organised them all. And and we had probably maybe three or four extra helpers needed for each event. So it wasn't that many people involved. Um, and you know, obviously, as, as things got bigger, we needed more people um, involved. And I guess the development group came in about three, two or three years after we kind of started those. And that was, I think, there's five people involved five or six people were involved in the development group was, yeah that was. was the development group was used once we started developing the club offer rather than just getting the participation involved yeah yeah, yeah. thank you thank you i've got two questions here which are linked this will be the last one and i'll let you get back into the presentation again um one's from Miranda is more and rather than a question it's more of a sort of a statement that the amount of work you're doing have done seems quite scary to the uninitiated but also linked to that Zoe has said you know, do you think um you would have had been successful had this improvement this development without um you know your development um role CDO so I, I don't I think it was really important to have somebody Doing, I don't think it would have been as so, so successful without it, because I the development role meant that all the initiatives happened when they should have happened, and they all got communicated really well to the club members. And I got to know all the club members and the new members and encouraged them along. And I, I just I think that that was really vital. Um, but. Um, um, it could be done by volunteers if you've got somebody who's willing to take on that role, who's not somebody who perhaps doesn't want to plan or organise, but they're really happy to communicate and send out club communications and just make sure that everything happens when it should happen. Um, but I think that role, having somebody to do that specific role, to do the marketing, to do the communication, 
is really important. Yeah, I mean, I think I think when you start off, you don't have to have, you, you certainly don't need a, a development officer there when you're, you know, starting these new you know, new events and things like that and series and seeing seeing what works. You just need a group of like-minded people who are willing to to give it a go. Essentially, um, I think where the development officer comes in is when you're starting to do lots of different things and trying to really bring those those participants that you've developed at the events into the club and and in as really active orienteers. Um, but I guess the big thing I see for someone who's being paid rather than volunteers is that they can they can pick up a lot of the things that volunteers really don't want to do. Um, and you know they just they just fill in the holes really as well um, and make sure that everything as Pauline said everything just um, is cohesive um, and, and act as that point of contact you know and and you know it's really important to say that um, as we developed more and more people got involved in the process and more and more pe more and more club members were were really happy to help and do loads of work and you know I think. Um, like, like I've got to mention Jackie, um, who is our junior team captain, who does an enormous amount of work focused on getting juniors along to things and junior running the junior competitions and getting people to do the kids to do that. So you can't do it alone, I think is the key point. You know, you really need um, people to work with who are like minded. I you know, I was going to say, I don't think there seems to be any particular problem with kind of having both volunteers and a paid person. I think, you know, everyone within the club sees the advantage of having Pauline doing the work because otherwise they recognise that it's a huge amount of work, you know, because there's it's interesting, you know, Pauline does essentially two days a week as a paid, sorry, I'm being moved into the shop. So Pauline gets, gets essentially two days a week as a paid um, post, but actually is doing far more in addition as a voluntary part. So it's, it's always quite tricky as to yeah, how it all balances out. Okay, thank, thanks very much. A link to that is sort of um, a message from Miranda there also about, I think you sort of answered this anyhow, so um, about sort of core club members, about, sort of the, with the development, did they get involved? But I think you did say that there were core core members who did get involved and really helped out and um, you know but maybe some felt marginalized I don't know because there's maybe more work towards newcomers or were they pretty uh, receptive I, yeah I mean uh, I, I don't Is that no comment probably no 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 it's not it's not I, I, I don't know whether some people felt marginalized and not interested I think maybe the younger adults felt the club was very family and kid focused I think that's fair enough and that's one of the reasons why we really did try to address that um you know try to make it less just about the kids um so that we didn't alienate those people um we we're a bit different to a lot of clubs because we don't have any very many old and retired people um which does make you know it it means we're short of a lot of volunteers <laughs> Because the retired people have the time, you know, so so that is one thing that is a bit more difficult. They, they might argue that they're they're very busy. The retired people. One thing was we focus on the juniors, but one of the main reasons for focusing on the juniors was because they're that they're they are low hanging fruit. They're they're the ones that are easy to get into the sport and then develop and and become you know the the planners and organisers of the future. It's much easier, even it's not easier getting teams in, you know, it's much easier getting primary school kids in than it is getting, you know, they're, they're, they're far more likely to come along to events and parents are far more likely to bring them and see that it's a good thing for them to do and then persuade them along. Um, yeah, yeah. Eight, I'd say eight targeting your eight and 10 year olds, that, that's the best, the best way to do it, get them in there. Um, uh, sorry, um, uh, going back to something Moran said, because she, she said a, it was a, about it's a huge amount of work. And, and I think it's really important that you, you've got to think about what your club capabilities are and who you've got. So, you know, pick, pick, 
just focus on one area to start off with. We just focused on a small area, getting newcomers to come to events. And then we went from there and, and getting some newcomers in and then running a coaching program. If I was to say, you know, where do we start? That's probably the area to start with. And, and you know, these, these events that we were putting on, you know, they're all within kind of two miles of our house. You know, it's, it, it makes it very straightforward. It's, it, the events were pretty straightforward to put on. Um, the marketing of it was, was relatively straightforward as well. You know, it's, it's, none of it was taking a huge amount of time. We weren't having to drive, like, you know, well, drive, drive long distances to get to these different places, you know. Um, and I think um, I, I saw a, a, a question there, you know, I, we're, we're South Yorkshire orienteers, but essentially, 95% of our members are from Sheffield and actually probably 70% are within like a, you know, a very small area. Um, and I think that's because probably that's where we focus the that's, development. That's where we focus our development and we, 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 we periodically talk about trying to do something in kind of the rest of South Yorkshire rather than Doncaster, um, Barnsley. But it's very hard, you know, that trying to do something over there when we're not there is much harder. And if we were to do something there, we may well try and, you know, maybe look at something like trying to get a sport in and grant and actually paying someone to, to manage that because we don't have, although we were a big club, trying to then manage and try and replicate what we're doing in Sheffield, say in, in Barnsley or in Doncaster. Um, you sort of look at that and think that's that's a lot of effort for us. You know, essentially we'd be talking about, you know, maybe going over there 10, 10 weekends a year to set something up and then do you know, it's it's just a lot of effort. Um so we're kind of aware that we need to do something, but we're not quite sure how we're gonna do it in the moment. Yeah, working within your limits. Yeah, basically, yeah. Thank you, thank you. I'll leave some more questions to, towards the end. Thanks. Paul. Okay, well I've almost done. I just wanted to show you you know, another slide, because so I, I wanted to share that, you know, it's not all positive all the time. Um, there's still plenty of development work to be done. Um, you know, actually, on at our Saturday series now, participation numbers are down, um, particularly in the secondary age juniors. Um, we lost a lot of occasional orienteers during COVID. And it's, and because we were, we had a couple of years where we couldn't really develop the juniors as much. Um, those, the, the that's meant a drop in secondary age kids, and it's really hard to attract new teenagers. And you need to get them in as primary kids, and then develop them as they get older and keep them orienteering. Um, and we tried to do some initiative to attract older people, and they weren't successful. Um, uh, Colin put on a U3A group which was popular and they really enjoyed it but they didn't come to events or join the club um, and permissions has been really difficult uh, so hard and I'm sure everyone um, can, and knows that feeling about how difficult permissions are to do anything um, and our development committee lapsed during Covid times um, you know, we need to re-establish that. It's really important to be keeping looking and evaluating things. So I just wanted to sort of share that, um, you know, developing is really hard work and everyone has their ups and downs. Um, you know, don't be put off by things not always going uh, to plan and think about celebrating the things that have gone well, not dwell on the things that haven't gone so well. Um, so I, I basically just have a slide to, um, you know, summarise the key points. Ten years ago, the club was declining and it has been revitalised. We've increased our membership. We've increased our active club members. We've got more volunteers and our club performance has improved. Um, and for me, the key thing is to get, increase your participation, get some newcomers and then develop what your club offers and just keep reviewing and improving the process. And uh, don't give up. And uh, that is the end. <laughs> so. The other thing I think um, is that, that I accept that it takes quite a while to, it takes quite a while to get things going. Um, and you have to play around with things and, 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 and try different things until, until you get things that work. And, and 
not be too disheartened if it doesn't happen on the first time. Um, and also that you've got to think of these new people coming in are hopefully going to be your volunteers, your planners and all this kind of stuff in the future. Um, so you might have a fairly low volunteer or number of volunteers at the moment, but they will hopefully become volunteers in the future. Um, but it can take quite a while. I reckon it probably takes you know, four or five years from someone starting off their orienteering to really sort of stepping up and, and taking on some of those bigger roles. So you kind of have to be prepared um, to invest quite a lot of effort to, to get these people um, to a standard. Well, thanks very much, Pauline and Pete as well. Contributions uh, I, certainly, obviously, it's something we all can take away. Is you know, the, you know, if you don't first succeed, try, try it again. But don't try, try, try again with the same method. You've yeah. evolved and changed and tried different things, and and that will happen. So I know we get discouraged maybe when we put on initiatives and they don't work. Um. So um. But it, there, there may be other ways, and hopefully we have gathered some some ideas from this. Well, I know I have as a. As a, speaking from a, a club perspective rather than a British Orienteers perspective. So thank you so much. I'm going to keep the session going. We've got another um, about 10 minutes or so. If anybody wants to answer, uh, ask any questions, we'll, we'll hang in here, won't we, Pauline, for another? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, that's fine, so, yeah. Um, I don't mind if people, um, you know, rather than use the chat box, want to, to put yourself off mute and, and chat, and we can maybe take down the, the presentation and if that's okay i'm trying to end this oh stop yeah stop sharing hello <laughs> so if, if any, you can see i'm slightly technologically um well, well, it's, it's gone very smoothly so no, just we'll, we'll hang on for a few minutes but I, I understand if people want to go or need to go please don't feel free don't feel as if you have to hang on um there are some questions still in the in the chat box here so um I'll maybe go through some of those first. Yeah, read those out to me. Yeah, that's good. Let's, let's go back. There's, there's been a few come in. There always is a few that ones, you know, everyone's been listening and, uh, and now they want to ask their questions. So that's great. Oh, is virtual is virtual orientation? So using like Map Run, for example, um, part of your development program was one question. Yeah, yeah. so we have, we did use Map Run during COVID um, and we have used it, um, but, so map room works best around the streets and we've got loads and loads of juniors and under 16s can't run on the streets. So that's why we are using Yeah. So we, we, we have done like an annual um, map room type event. We do do a bit of street orienteering, but it's just not something that, we've done because of our high junior memberships so much um and it just doesn't work quite so well in a park or anything really i think it's it, it's it's best as the street type orienteering we used it a bit but we used it during lockdown but it's not a strategy going forward that we use um, keep going here then thank you very much and um, have you done much um, with inter club competition you know, I know it's obviously you have your own your own club things, but um, and you'd have obviously your regional things and whatnot. But there's a question here is coming from Alex: Would better into club competitions maybe create a bit more club spirit? Yeah, so I I, I would really like to um, make a a league from our Wednesday night events. Definitely, I think um, that would be good um, to make to make a league out of those because they happen every once a month. Um, throughout the year, so that would be a really good, good, good league. Was that, sorry, was that an inter club or within club? Inter club. So. Oh, I oh guess, sorry, I thought you meant within club. Yeah. Sorry, I'm. Sorry. I, I think it. I think, I think it means between like local clubs, maybe. A, yeah. Well, so, um, we challenged DVO juniors once, didn't we? We challenged <laughs> DVO and not juniors to an inter junior competition, and that was that was that was good. Yeah, that that worked, but we, it was a bit uneven, um, obviously. Because we had loads of juniors, but um, it was good, you know. Um, that sort of thing is good. I mean, people really enjoy coming along to Compass Sport Cup. I mean, we had a, a fabulous turnout at the recent Compass Sport Cup final. Um, um, keep going here for these questions. Um, obviously, 
probably you'd be one of the bigger clubs. Um, certainly, um, well, in your area, if not the whole of the UK. No, I, th- I think we are a really big yeah. club. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, and that, and that, I'm very aware that we have so, a lot of advantages in terms of what we can do because we're a big club, and because we've got a population that's located close to each other. It's much harder if your club spans an entire county and your and your members are spread out all over it makes it much harder to do what we've done here yeah yeah and that's there's a there what advice would you give to small clubs with limited number of volunteers but i think maybe that's something which maybe somebody here maybe from a small club and has tried some ideas which were successful so yeah, i'd be I mean, really I... interested if anybody wants to share it doesn't have to be from from pauline or myself there so but uh, yeah sorry pauline you're going to say something oh i was just going to say just to pick something small, you know, run a small series of events in one area um, and then and then invite those people who've come to those events along to coaching and try and get them to join the club. You know, you could just do it on a much smaller scale than what we Yeah, doing. and even with... We tended to find that when people start, were starting, they were only prepared to travel, you know, two or three miles almost. So it was kind of... There wasn't much point in putting... You know, you could, you could think we're used to traveling quite a long way to events, you know, but you could think, OK, we could do the first one in, in that town, that next one in the, the town over there, you know, 10 miles away. People that you're not going to get very many people traveling from one town to, to the next to, to do a, a Saturday series. I don't think and you're certainly more likely if you can find a, a number of parks or something within a fairly central location um, and, and, and just accept that it's it's not going to cover everybody in the club. But, but if you can build a little nucleus and build that up and then you can move on to another part uh, area and, and do that do it there. And I think it's really important to say that the areas, the parks we use are really small. They're not big parks. You know, it's not like a big country park. Um, if anybody wants to look, we have one of our most successful um, events where we get most participants is in the Sheffield Botanical Gardens. And if you look on a map, you'll see how small it is. Um, Okay. And, and the, when, the white courses are winning time normally of about six minutes. Five, six minutes winning um, time. The yellow yeah. is about, you know, 10, 11, 12. You know, these are, and kids do multiple courses. You know, they, they come back and they'll, they'll do start in the white, then the yellow, then the orange, you know, so. I saw a question about permissions costs somebody had asked. Um, so using the parks, we just pay an annual fee to Sheffield City Council for being able to use parks. Um, for we have a, a, a price structure that if it's over 50 adults, we pay quite a lot more. But if it's an event with under 50 adults, it's really quite low, those costs. We, we pay hardly anything. And that's because we're putting those events on for juniors and kids for free. We get a good deal with the council. So it's worth negotiating on permissions, costs, particularly with councils, if you can, um, use areas where you don't have to pay lots to run the events. Yeah, I think of councils, especially um, with, with juniors as well, they'd be very keen for you to use their parks. So, yeah, and a lot somebody, of areas. And somebody said, how many events do we run? So we have basically uh, once a month Saturday, or well, nine Saturday in the year, um, just in term times, and uh, 12 Wednesday night events and then a range of Sunday regionals and nationals normally about seven, seven, eight, eight, or eight to ten yeah. right. it, also, probably probably not that many more than other big clubs to be honest yeah. I, I look at the uh, at the events in the Lake District and there's kind of like there's like one a week and I'm amazed at how they can do that many um, but I think you know. we put a lot of effort, volunteer effort into our club nights. And when you're running a club night for 70 people, it's like putting on an event every week anyway. So, you know, it's quite, quite hard work. And then Anne asked, is Shoe Art still going strong? So um, Shoe Art does still exist and um, we do work with them. In fact, the current Shoe Art committee are pretty uh, keen and they even planned and organised one of our Wednesday night events um on uh, just back in november and did a brilliant job and um we are helping them put on books 
at the end of February. So, um, yeah, no, we, we, we work well with them. I mean, it's definitely smaller than it used to be. Um, we tend to not to get any Scots coming down to Sheffield um, like they used to. So, yeah. Um, and Richard asks about using pox. Our, we, we, have, we, have, we don't have many permanent orienteering courses because we, uh, we can't, we can only, the only permanent orienteering courses we can use are um, our control sites we could have with on path junctions because Sheffield City Council, which so many of our areas are owned by, won't let us orienteer off paths um, all year round. Um, so uh, we're a bit limited as to what we can put on and our parks are really small. Um, we've got a few permanent orienteering courses, but um, I, we, we've not got a great supply to do anything with them, really. Um, that, is a good, that is a good idea, Richard. You know, certainly if, if there are clubs which have permanent orienteering courses, you know, it's, I think that's something which certainly British orienteering would like to be used more. You know, so. yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, we... Uh, Manchester do great work with their permanent, Manchester and District Orienteering Club do great work with their permanent orienteering courses and um, North Gloucester, fabulous map run series of events. Um, and, that, and that's the thing, we, you know, not every club does things the same way and it's good to look at other clubs and take ideas. And, um, you know, yes, that those might work, but, but how, we just don't have that here, but for other clubs that could work really well. Yeah, and Richard said, yeah, it does need to maintenance. People, it does need checked, and there's nothing yeah. really worse than going to a really bad pop and if the control's not there, yeah. it does require a, a pop manager in the club. What you really want from your, your, your permanent orienteering courses, I think, I guess you can do this now, is, is you, you want to know who's doing them, and you want those contact details so that you can send them information about other things that you're doing. It's all about being joined up, so it's... It's no good, but it's okay for people to go out and do permanent courses and, and not do anything more. But if they're doing, you know, two or three, you kind of want to know so that you can you can tell them about other things that are happening and tell them, you know, um, about about your club and what you're doing um, and, and trying to get people in that way. It's, um, yeah. And Corinne has just mentioned there about changing the permanent orientation courses into um, sort of virtual orientation courses. And that's, that's what's happening here to, you know, yeah. Um, with clubs that a lot of them are doing that because posts go missing, um, so they're 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 just you know, they're changing those, which is a really useful idea. So, and you know, so it's certainly I, a, without much without a huge amount of work, you can create those courses. Yeah. Um, and somebody has said about training ideas. Um, so <laughs> maybe, maybe the SOA. <laughs> Yeah, SOA um, puzzles have been a, a great source of uh, um, activities for when we've done indoor club nights. So thank you, SOA. That, that, their lockdown resources were brilliant. Um, I just look all over the place for ideas. There's various websites you can find, and I'd read um, uh, articles in um, Compass Sport with the sort of event format ideas. Um, and also, like, um, I take ideas from J Ross tours and uh, um, coaching other people, other coaches. I'm always looking out for new ideas all the time. Um, yeah. And, I, and then sometimes I just sit there and come up with something random that sometimes doesn't work. But <laughs> well, I think we'll leave it there. We're slightly over an hour, but I'm sure everyone's. Um... So, so happy with what we've heard and, and what we've learned tonight. So thank you so much, Pauline, and, um, for your contribution and, contri contribution and also to Pete there in the background, or not so much in the background, a bit in the foreground there too. So thank I you so much. Models. I knew he would. <laughs> he would. And, uh, um, I was just going to say that if, you know, I'm really willing to um, offer you personal advice and, you know, I have people from other O clubs do contact me from time to time and we have a little zoom meeting we have a chat about what what we've done so you know please get in touch if you want some help i'm really happy to help well thank you very much i'm sure it's helpful this evening it's lovely to see everybody and maybe see you at a further um session later in um, this month so all the very best thank you very much
Good evening. Bye-bye, Mike. Bye. Bye-bye.